So I know you guys are hungry, so we need the granola bar just to energize you a little bit. I'll try to keep the talk as fast as possible because I don't want to keep you guys from your dinner. Is that okay? Uh, no, it's all right. Is that okay, everyone? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So my name is Francis Miranda, and today I'm going to be talking to you about experiential branding. But before everything, I'll introduce myself briefly. So I'm an inspired premier mentor and coach. So what I do is I I give I help a lot of people who want to become inspired premiers. I t I train them to how how to become inspired premiers. So what's an inspired premier? It's a person who makes a living out of inspiring people. When you're authors, speakers, team builders. So I have a group of people that I'm mentoring and I'm forming under this program. But at the same time, I've been in advertising for 17 years. So I've been working in, in advertising. I started as a copywriter. I rose through the ranks. I became creative director. I became executive creative director. I worked in, my first job was in an ad agency in Barcelona for two years. I wound up in Manila, then I went back. I went to KL, then I came back to Manila. So I've been around. I've been, this has been what I've been doing. I've been doing a lot of advertising. I ended my career as Chief Operating Officer of an ad agency here in the Philippines. So, so two years ago, I decided, you know what, Turn, toss the table. I want to I wanna do this. I want to be a professional speaker. I want to build my own business. And the business that we built was, the first is Unapologetic Dude. So we are a company that has a lot of speakers. Our brand of speaking is irreverent. So we're called Irreverent Inspiration. So we're not your nice, nice speakers. We're very irreverent in your face. So that's the type of speakers that we have. I'm a business partner in 360 Fitness Club. So we own a gym. We have five gyms all over Metro Manila. The good news, we are opening our first branch in New York in November slash December. So we will be the first international Filipino fitness and wellness company. So yes, that's why I'm going there in November because that's going to be my job to fix it there, OK? I'm the co-founder of the After Six Club and Design Entrepreneur Academy. I'm also a partner with Kia over here. Kia, raise your hands, please, there. Hi. So we're partners <laughs> in a content company called BraveWorks. At the same time, I'm a serial traveler. I love to travel. And please add me up on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I would appreciate it if you add me up there. So that's, those, are my, those are my handles. You know, when I did this journey of becoming a speaker, I really subscribed to one fundamental belief where you gotta tailor fit your life to how you want it. And perfect, we have tailor fit stuff here. We have like gowns for rent, so that's tailor fit. So I, and we have some designers here also for clothes, if I'm not mistaken. So I've always believed that a lot of people, they live their life in ready to wear. So ready to wear, which means what, what the life that they're living doesn't exactly fit. But we have a choice. We have a choice to make our life, our business fit with what we want. When I decided to go into entrepreneurship, I remember talking to one of my mentors and my mentor was telling me, you know Francis, you came from a toxic advertising life. So if you become an uh, entrepreneur, you have to make sure that your entrepreneurship will, is not toxic because it's not like you're jumping from one fire to another. Make sure that now that you have control over your time, you have the power to decide. You want to travel, that's the reason why you chose to become an entrepreneur. You wanted to travel. Create a business that allows you to travel while you're doing your work. Because otherwise, what's the point of you retiring? So that's what I did. And, and that's, how, what, that's how I designed the career that I wanted. I really made sure that there was ample opportunity for me to work globally. And the beauty of it is in today's world, you can be anywhere and still get work done. I remember just a couple of months ago, I was in Peru, I was in Lima, Peru, and I had a job here. I had a logo that I had to design, and I loved it. I loved the fact that I was overlooking the beach, fixing the logo, sending it to Manila, and yet you, you still got paid. And I think that, that's an opportunity that's, that all of us have right now, the beauty of the internet. You know, for, when I started working in advertising, we had desktop computers, so, and we had diskettes. Who remembers floppy disks? So we had floppy disks. Before the USBs, we had floppy disks, right? And I remember we could not work outside of office because you can't bring home your desktop. That was a blessing and that was, I think, a blessing also because I love the fact that when you logged out, you logged out. Right now, your work follows you, right? So today, I was asked to talk to you about branding, but a different type of branding, which I call experiential branding. But let's go first to some basic branding stuff. So I'm gonna give an exercise to you guys, okay? I want you to think of the first thing that pops into your mind when I say a category. Is that okay? Yeah. 
Yeah. The first, do not censor it. Because when I did this before, somebody was telling me, oh, I thought that, but I decided it's so common, so I changed it. I said, no, the instruction is, say the first thing that pops into your mind. So, so when I, I want you to shout to me, what's the first thing that pops to your mind when I give a category? Is that okay? Okay, so the very first one, search engine. What's the first thing that pops to your mind? Google. Did anyone here say Bing? <laughs> Yahoo? Did anyone say Yahoo? No one. Alta Vista! Oh my gosh, my age came out. Alta Vista, right? Okay, next one. Luxury car. Ferrari. So mixed. So there's Rolls Royce, there's BMW. Did, did anyone say Mercedes Benz? Mercedes Benz. Okay, very good. Next. Computer company. Apple. Apple. <laughs> Dell. Apple. Okay. Who said Apple? Can I have a show of hands? Apple? Okay. Who said Dell? Who said IBM? <laughs> no one. Okay. Last one. Coffee shop. Starbucks. Starbucks. So very clear, right? And you guys are correct. The number one that pops out is Google. The number one, well, not number one, luxury is divided. So some people say Mercedes. Apple, predominantly, a lot of you said Apple. And of course, coffee shop, majority said Starbucks, if not more. And that's really the power of branding, right? That's what branding is. And the textbook definition, which we're just going to go through briefly because you all know this, branding is the marketing practice of creating a name, symbol, or design that identifies and differentiates a product from other products. The key here is the red part. It identifies and differentiates your product from others. What makes your product distinct from everyone else? The raw honey, you've got to discover what makes your raw honey different from others. Is it rawer than others or is it the rawest honey ever? Then you gotta be able to tell that story because again, if another person comes up with raw honey, then that's where you're gonna have a problem. So you gotta figure out how, how that's differentiated, right? So, but you know, when, whenever I give a talk about branding, a lot of people, they have this misconception. So there's a lot of branding people here. Can I have a show of hands, the branding people here? Those who are in the business of branding, very good. So I'm sure you guys have also encountered this argument. I mean, do you guys hate it whenever people try to cheapen the, the, the money that they're gonna pay us because they don't understand what we do? They think, oh, it's just a logo. You can do that in like an hour. Why do you have to pay 80,000 pesos for a logo? Cheapen us. And right now, there's so many misconceptions around branding. I'm gonna share with you the three misconceptions that I tend to, to have. The first one is, it's the same as advertising. The second, it's only good for big companies. And the third, it's expensive. Let's go to them one by one. So first, it's the same as advertising. Branding is not the same as advertising. Advertising is the result of good branding. If your branding is clear, if you know what it is, then you can do great ads. But if your branding is not clear, every ad that you come out with is gonna suck. So very important, it's very important for us to know that it is not the same. Branding is the foundation of advertising, but it is not advertising alone, okay? The next one, it's only for big companies. So small entrepreneurs would approach me, do I really need branding? I'm a small entrepreneur, I'm just a startup. All, I, all we just have is one product, a bottle of raw honey. Do we need branding? Yes, you do, because it's important for you to get that correct at the beginning so that you avoid mistakes and you're very clear to the consumers what your benefit is. You know, I, I love um, Kat. Kat, can, can you raise your hands? So Kat has a jewelry business and the thing that makes her jewelry unique is they're like, I call them transformer jewelry because one piece of jewelry can transform into two different things. Like a pendant can become an earring or something like that. So it's very unique. So that's what makes her product unique. And she's a, a young entrepreneur, but she has a very clear branding that her products are all about the versatility because that's what she believes. She likes stuff that's versatile. That's the products that she created. So it's not, it's not true that it's only for the big companies. But at the same time, the third myth is that it's expensive. It can be expensive, yes. And in fact, some, sometimes it is very expensive, but it doesn't have to be all the time. But it's very important for us as young entrepreneurs to realize the value of it because sometimes we cheat our poor branding and advertising partners because we say, oh, come on, can it be X deal? Can I give it? 
Okay, and many people are reacting there. So, who here has had that experience, a horrible experience of X deal? Very good. So, appreciate what it does. That's why you need to invest in it. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking branding is an expense when in fact it's an investment. It's an investment you build over time, right? So now, like what I said earlier, branding is more than your logo or ads. And today we're going to talk about a special type of branding which I call experiential branding. So what is experiential branding? Experiential branding, beyond the logo, it is actually creating a unique signature culture that consistently communicates to consumers what your brand stands for. Wow, that word, culture. The only culture I knew is Lacto Basilei Shirota Strength. <laughs> Yako, no? <laughs> said, oh, I like yogurt, I'm cultured. <laughs> I like bacteria, I'm cultured, right? So, but experiential branding is all about creating a culture in your company as well that the consumers feel and experience. That is unique to you. It is your signature. It's like whenever people see you, they know it's you because of how you react, how you, how you're, you're being, how your people services them. What are the surprises that they get? Um, the, the girl on the phone, her name is Kyla, over there. Hi. Hi. So Kyla, she has a unique brand. She's very noisy. So every time we see her, we expect her to be absolutely noisy and wild. So that's the brand that she stands for. Okay. Now. Experiential branding is all about what consumers experience. How do they experience you and your brand when they interact with you? Yeah. Who here has had horrible customer service experiences? Can I have a show of hands? Customer service experience, right? Horrible. We remember that. That's part of even if the brand, even if the logo or the tagline of, of this particular company or the ad says, we have your best interest in heart. We're here to serve you. We are. We give you true service. But if you don't experience it, all of that seems just like a lie, right? That's why it's important what do our consumers experience in whatever we do. If we're a real estate agent, how do they experience us? I'll give you some examples of some cases I, I handle. If you're an insurance agent, how do they experience us? And experiential branding is all about creating a unique customer service culture within your company that the consumers feel. It's not just enough that they see, they hear it in an ad. They have to feel it. They have to feel the love. And I'll share with you one of the most mind-blowing consumer experiences I've had. So, I, I was lucky enough to be invited to the wedding of a friend in Amanpulo. So, Amanpulo is like a super expensive resort. And before you say, oh my god, you're so rich. No, it was 50% off. So me and my friends were like saying, guys, we have to go to this wedding because when will we get a chance to afford this freaking Amanpulo? So we flew to Amanpulo, right? And I was amazed. The moment we landed in the island, once we stepped out of the private plane, oh my gosh, private plane. Right? Once we stepped out of the private plane, the people knew my name. Mr. Mr. Francis Miranda, hi, welcome to Manpulo. I'm your private butler. I'm here to take you to your cabina. Oh my gosh, he knew my name and I have a cabina. I have my own cabin and the, the golf course was waiting there for me and everyone there knew my name. The waiters, it was so freaky. I was like, oh my gosh, how do they know me? Am I not famous? Oh my gosh, and then I discovered talking to the staff, you know, being friendly. Oh, how do you know our names? Apparently, they're required to memorize all the guests coming in. So, because we send a photo, they know us by name. That's a wow experience for me. I've never encountered wow. And like here in the Philippines, I hate it when people say, good morning, ma'am, sir. <laughs> Don't you hate that? I mean, I mean, he doesn't even exert an effort to know your gender. <laughs> ma'am, sir, right? Is it that difficult for me to, uh, I mean, but there they know your name. And that was like a very powerful experience for me. And suddenly, it made you realize why Amanpulo was that expensive. Why they charge so high. And because of that unique experience, they can charge that high to the level that we, we were paying still out of our noses and our salaries, 50, even though it was 50% it was still expensive, it was still worth it for us. To have been able to experience that, right? 
And that's the power of branding. Now I'm going to share with you some examples of some um, experiential branding um, good practices that, my, that people I've handled with in, in, in branding. So one of them is a real estate company. So I handle a real estate company, one of the biggest in the Philippines. I can't reveal their name yet, but I can reveal what their culture is in terms of branding. The culture is simply this. It's hashtag first world. What does this mean? This means that this company, this real estate company, makes it their vision that they will transform the Philippines into a first world country by the things that they construct. To make Filipinos appreciate what first world construction is. And some of their, some of their um, properties that they've developed, oh my gosh, I really feel like I'm actually in Singapore or in the United States. It's very high tech, very clear. And how does this translate into their culture? It translates into their culture that they have it in their vocabulary that if the word is sloppy, they say that's not first world, that's third world work. So even their staff, even the people doing the cement, they know, they all Pare, third world yan, ha? It's their culture, it became part of their culture. That's a branding that they experience, that they want. That every time somebody steps into their property, wow, it's like I stepped in a first world country. That's it. I'll reveal, because I think I can reveal it anyway. It's Mactan Airport. The new Mactan Airport. When you've been inside the new Mactan Airport, oh my gosh, for the first time in my life, I feel like this is the airport a Filipino deserves. It's amazing. And that's it. It's spring. That's their branding. First world. The second one, a young entrepreneur. Her name is Flo Bayer. Her story is she likes to create surprises for people. So she's a young entrepreneur. This is not Mactan Airport. This is a young entrepreneur. Her unique style, she likes to give surprises to people. So her branding is all about having a hidden surprise. That means in every product that she has, there is always a hidden surprise hidden in the big product. You can have a white chocolate cupcake that has a surprise wasabi flavored core. So you bite into it and suddenly boom, there's a surprise. If, if you get her for a wedding cake, she bakes something hidden into the cake and she gives you a card saying, Thank you very much for entrusting me with your wedding. I have hidden a surprise inside the cake for you to discover later on. It's a bill. No, no, it's not a bill. It's, it, it's like a new, it's a, cho it's, a, it's a chocolate truffle hidden camouflage inside the cake. And that's her brand. That's the unique experience of every time you buy a Flow Bayer product, there is always a surprise connected to it. Whether it's a cupcake, whether it's a, a, a sponge cake, there's something hidden in it. Next one, a fashion brand. Her branding is inspiring story. So she creates wedding gowns for brides. And what she simply does is this. Prior to the, prior to the, the, the bride engaging her, she'll, she'll have a one-on-one -on -one session with the bride, coffee or dinner or lunch, and she'll get to know the bride's story. And that is what will inspire her to create that creation. When she delivers the gown, there's a storybook attached to the gown which narrates the story of the bride. Suddenly, boom, that's a unique experience. Nobody else does that. Real estate, who here in real estate? So, I did the personal branding for a real estate um, agent, and he said that in his market, the ones who buy are actually the Gen Xers. I said, like, okay, so I was expecting this to say, who's your target market? Millennials, no. For him, the main, per the main people who buy are the Gen Xers because they buy to, it let to eventually leave it to their kids, inherit it. So what he does with them is he said, I want to stand for inherited trust, meaning I'm gonna take care of you so that when the time comes that your kids buy property, they're gonna buy it from me also. And because he's dealing with older people, he is extremely patient. He really explains everything. The contract will have little post-it arrows which explain the things that they would be that would be difficult for them to understand. And when the time comes to turn over the property, he has dinner with the family. With the family. He treats the family to dinner. That way, the kids remember him. Because for him, property is inherited. So therefore, trust should also be inherited. Last, for me, irreverent inspiration. My unique trend, my friends can attest to this, I'm very irreverent. I really, I'm, I'm, I'm different, I'm, 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 
kind of like a weird Filipino because I'm very irreverent, I'm very direct. We Filipinos, let's face it, we're not that direct. I'm very direct, I'm very irreverent. So I wanted to create a speaking platform precisely on being irreverent. And that and whenever 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 somebody deals with me, it's that. That's what they'll expect. I, I pull no punches. When pe when I mentor people, I'm very brutal. Who here has been mentored by me already? Raise your hand. So there. I am very brutal with them. I said, okay, you know, fine, you can delay it, not a problem. But anyway, it's your problem. I mean, it would be it depends on how fast you want to succeed. You, you don't want to succeed quickly? Then delay it by all means. But I always tell people, if you sit down with me to, to get my opinion, to consult me on something, to, to help mentor you on something, you better execute because I don't like my time being wasted if you're not going to get shit done. Because for me, one of the things I believe in as a, as a person who gives inspiration is the true proof of inspiration is to get shit done. Because if you tell me, oh, Franz, I was so inspired by your talk. Okay, what did you do about it? Oh, nothing. Then you're not inspired. The proof is to get shit done. So that said, I'll take you through the journey of an experience of our gym, of 360. So the 360 journey. So that's our stuff. And, you know, in, 2000, in 2010, we started small but we had big dreams. We were competing against Fitness First and Gold's Gym at the time. And we started out with this gym. Oh my gosh, I remember when I was asked to be a partner here and, and they, they showed me the plans. I was like, thinking, huh, that's a gym? Where the hell are the treadmills? Where, because I used to work out in Fitness First. So where are all these things? Where are the bikes and stuff? And what we did was we created a new type of gym which was called a functional fitness gym. The objective was, was no machines, Use your body weight, use circuit, use a um, we, we created a unique circuit that you burn double the fat in 30 minutes, but that's our gym. So we said, we can't possibly compete against Fitness First and Gold's Gym in terms of expansion and in terms of equipment. I mean, look at the, look at the way our first branch look, right? But what can we compete in? We can compete simply in Starting small, but never starting small with the experience. We chose the best of the best coaches, and we made sure that when e whatever they do, the customer has to feel like they are the most cared for customer inside our gym. And this was our first coach, our first coaches, the four people there. And currently, these four are still with us, and guess what? They are all partners in the gym. They co-own now the gym with us. And that's our way of giving thanks to them because these four coaches, they provided world-class care to our customers. We were a local Filipino startup, but our customers really felt they were loved. And that's it. Care become what 360 was known for. So from the original coaches, we now have dozens of 360 fitness coaches. And one thing was short, care was the foundation of our service excellence. That we made it a point that we wanted to say, we are the gym that cares the most. If a person does not show up after a month of signing up, for other gyms, that's pure profit. Because if a person doesn't show up, that's the, that's the trend. After one month, they're not going to show up anymore. But our goal is we have a tracker to identify how many have not shown up in a month. Because it's the responsibility of the gym and the coaches to make sure they show up. Because it's hard to get new customers. So keep the old ones. As long as they're constantly working out, Remind them, oh, you, I haven't seen you in a month. What's up? You want to come? Why don't you come today? We'll work out. And that's the mantra. We said that we were going to be the gym that cares the most. And from the four, this is where we are right now. That's how big we become. And we were just amazed at how, how fast we grew. And right now, we're going to open our branch in New York. So we're going to be the first Filipino fitness brand who's a multinational, so wow. One of our coaches is already there, he went ahead. So, so I'm going to follow in November because we're gonna have to put it up. And it's, it's amazing to have a Filipino brand in the Big Apple. It's gonna be a challenge, definitely. We created something different, something new, because the New Yorkers are like a different breed altogether. So we gotta compete on a different level. So even that one will evolve. But as you can see, Customer experience is, is at the heart of it. And I'm going to share with you some examples. Let me know if you can guess what brand I'm talking about. 
This one is painful for me to share, but I'll share it with you. Um, sorry, hindi ako pwede. Malayo siya sa pupunta. Ang traffic pa, dagdagan mo yung 100 pesos. Okay na yan. What, what do you think that is? Taxi. A taxi. Okay, it's for our, our, our non-Filipino speakers. It says, sorry, I can't. It's far. It's far from where I'm going. It's traffic. Add 100 bucks, it's gonna be okay. That's a tram. That's a taxi cab. We all know the experience because it sucks. Right? But then the opposite was, ah, here, here's another. Hi, ma'am, sir. Order your phone, ma'am, sir. What's that? Fast food. Fast food. Right? So any fast food restaurant. But this one I miss. Good morning, Sir Francis. Is the air conditioning on? If you're comfortable, can we begin our trip? Uber. Uber. Oh, I miss you, Uber. Come back. Right? <laughs> Wasn't that the experience, the consistent experience of Uber? Yes. That's why I loved it. Oh my gosh. They know your name and they say your name because it's in the phone, but they say the name, right? Good morning, may I have your name for the cup? May I know your drink, please? Starbucks. Starbucks. I discovered that that's a global mandate of Starbucks, that they have to ask your name and the rule is that if you are a regular in that branch by your third visit, the barista should memorize your name already. So what I do, I love testing that. Third visit. Sir Francis, yes, good job you, Sir Frank, oh sorry, no, <laughs> Francis, but it, you see the effort that they put in it, it's a global mandate for them to remember your name after your third visit, and that's a, the consistency of the experience that we get, right? I mean, before, before Starbucks came to this country, nobody ever asked you your name for your cup of coffee, right? Now it's like the most normal thing, because that's the culture branding that they did. Now. Of course, in a highly competitive environment, the client's experience matters online and offline. Especially right now, we're dealing in a world where you, you just behave badly to a customer that can bite you in the ass. We've seen this happen many times, right? And successful entrepreneurs know that the best branding is a good experience that your clients can stop raving about. How does your service excel to the level that your clients will, will, will rave about you. Because let's face it, right now we're living in a world of total digital transparency. Things can blow up on the internet if you're not careful. That tactless comment you give to a person can explode. That, that when you played, when you became, when you said a bad word to a customer because you were angry, that can appear in Yelp forever. And client ex it is your client experience to a service exit that defines who will eventually get you. And your marketing materials, they're definitely going to help, but what sets you apart is the total experience. Because good experience, they get clients, but the one thing is for sure, the elevated version is to, to have a wow experience, because the wow experience will get you loyalists. So now, let's talk about the wow experience. So what's the wow experience? The wow experience for me, we define it in three in three letters. E, P, C. The wow experience is extraordinary, progressive, and consistent. And I want you to look at your particular brands, whether you are an, whether you are a solopreneur, meaning like say Adrian, you work for Ayala International, but in essence you're like a solopreneur because you also have your unique brand as Adrian. You gotta check how are you applying this in your day-to-day -day interaction. So the very first one is the extraordinary. What does extraordinary mean? It's something your clients have never experienced before beyond what everyone else does. I remember, um, there's one foot spa area in Alabang that I love. It's called Mandarin. And what I love about it is that they have this unique tea. I have not encountered this tea anywhere else, but they give it to you at the beginning of your massage and at the end. And that tea locks into my brain to the point that sometimes I crave for the tea, so I'm going to get a massage just to get the freaking cup of tea, which is free. But they have that. They have that experience. They, they always ask you, they, the, the experience is consistent. Whatever day you go, whoever, whoever the, the therapist is, the, the, the experience is consistent. But, but it is something that, wow, I've never experienced before. That you have a cup of tea, a steaming cup of tea. They know you. They make you relax. They ask you some questions. There's a ritual. I call it sacramentalizing it, like if you're a Catholic, you have a sacrament, so that's it. It's all about creating a ritual when your customers deal with you. 
my, my friend who does the wedding gowns, her ritual is she creates the storybook and she gives that storybook to the client as a, as a thank you as, as she ends. Yeah. It's meticulously engineered to think about the client. And when you talk about the client, it's an entrance to exit experience online to offline, which means the moment your client steps into the door, you have to orchestrate that experience already. Meaning, it's engineered. It's not something that happens accidentally. You purposefully make it happen. In Starbucks, go in front of the merchandising tape, the merchandising wall. They have to engage you in 20 seconds. If you're just like standing there, I love it, I test them on this. <laughs> Such a creep sometimes. I can go there, I'll, I'll stay there and I, I have no intention of buying a mug, right? So I'm just gonna stay there and then 10 seconds. Sir, can I help you with anything? Wow, it really works. But that's orchestrated, they're trained to do that. And the same is true with our staff. How do we train our, let's say, for those in branding agencies, how do we train our account managers to respond? My my rule with my account managers before when I was working in an ad agency, if the client follows up, you're too late. You have to anticipate the client. And the other rule we give, over, uh -huh, under promise, over deliver. Like don't tell them, oh we can do that in one day. Say, so I need three days to get that done. So if you're done on the second day, you're early. That's it. And those are things that, 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 that a lot of people, especially in this country, it's a challenge and we can easily elevate ourselves because deadlines are taken so lax in this country. But if you meet simple things as deadlines, it makes a difference. <laughs> Small details more than grand gestures. In the gym, in our company, in 360, I'm known as Mr. Toilet. So they kind of have this, they talk behind my back and they, they call me Mr. Toilet. Why? My rule is very simple. Every time I go to any branch, the first thing I will go into is the toilet. And I will check if it's dry. That the toilet is flushed and the showers are dry. Meaning the floor of the toilet is dry. Because it's so gross if you go to a shower and it's wet. And I remember when, when I gave this rule to the team, they were like complaining, oh, that's impossible. What, sir? Every time somebody comes in, we have to clean the floor. I told them, when I went to Incheon, I flew Ishana, so I was in the business class lounge. There's a shower in Incheon. So I decided, okay, well, there's a free shower. Let's use the shower, right? There was an old lady. She must have been like 70 or 60 years old. She was the janitor. So before I stepped into the shower, she said, no, not yet. I need to clean it. I said, oh my gosh, it's gonna take forever to clean it. She enters the shower. Five minutes later, she exits. It's dry. It's clean. And the shower doesn't have a curtain, it has glass. And the glass is dry. And how grandmother was able to do that in five minutes, it stunned me. And I told them, if granny can do that in five minutes, you guys are healthy young men. I think you can do it as well, right? And that's it, because it's the details. Would you go to a gym where you saw a bit of curly hair there? No, right? You would not, right? And, and that's it. Those things matter to me. Because there are small things that consumers matter, that matters to consumers. Lastly, it needs clients to share about it with their friends. If the experience is extraordinary, what do we do? We talk about it. We tell people, we post it on Facebook. And here's the fact, guys. If somebody, Filipino is very normal to post negative stuff. It's the easiest thing to do. But if they post something positive about you, it means you really made an impact. Because we Filipinos will tend to not post anything positive unless it really blew our minds. If it's just good, we're not gonna post about it. But if it's bad, we're gonna post about it. So if they post about it, then you know you've done a good job. Now the second one is progressive. So when you talk about progressive, it simply means that the experience always gets better in subtle ways. So you don't need to elevate your level of service like a million levels higher. Just a small level. So that, because if you keep elevating it at such a high level, you're gonna have a hard time catching up to yourself. So the objective is just elevate it a little bit, right? But at the same time, you're also open to adapting to the needs of your clients while faithful to your core principle. Like if you're, if you're doing, let's say, if, if you have one particular service and then the clients keep asking for this service and you keep telling them, oh, we don't have that, oh, we don't have that. By the fifth time somebody asks you that question, you should already have it because you've already adapted. Oh, they're asking for this, so therefore I should give it. 
Because so many wasted opportunities happen because simply of oh, it's not in our it's not in our service. Okay, what will what will you? Do? I remember I was dealing with a friend of mine who owns a tailoring shop, one of the oldest bespoke tailors in the country, and and so. Uh, an entire battalion of a bridal concert came and they were saying can you do um, the suits for the groomsmen but this is the type of cloth that we want and this was like maybe seven groomsmen and my friend when she was telling me the story because I was consult I was helping her in her branding her staff said oh we don't have that cloth so they left and my friend was like oh my gosh she was like can you imagine she was like this was seven suits, easily 70,000 pesos because assuming each suit is around 10 to 12,000. We could have simply said, we'll get the cloth, we'll find the freaking cloth, right? But she said, okay, I, we don't have that cloth. The opportunity walked away. Because they were, not, they were not open to adapt. Their people were not open. So now, the rule is, say yes, we'll worry about it later on. <laughs> And lastly, it's a learning environment to constantly improve so that your clients always experience as something new and better. The objective is really always have an innovation lab for customer service. You gotta figure out how can you constantly innovate and create new things. You guys have launched your granola bars. It doesn't stop there. You gotta level the game up. How, what will your next iteration be that will, become, that will make it better, right? You're transforming jewelry. Yeah, you gotta figure out how to elevate that story eventually and to make it better. And that, because you know the war for customer service, it's never won. It's a battle won, fought every day. The moment, because the moment you say that oh we've mastered customer service, that's the beginning of the end for you. It is a daily battle. Seriously, it never ends. And the last one is it's consistent. What does consistent mean? So for me, number one, there are things that we do that are consistently excellent. Like our coaches, the consistently excellent thing that they do is what we call the roadmap. When a person walks into the gym for the very first time, they will diagnose what the person's needs are, starting from mindset all the way to the nutrition, all the way to the movement. Mindset is important. Our coaches will always ask about the mindset because it's not just about the movement, but what's your real deep motivation for doing it? They're excellent in that. But at the same time, there are things that are constantly improving. That's why in our case, we invest in the training of our coaches. Right now, we're training our coaches to be meta-coaches. We're training them in neuro-linguistic programming so that they are able to properly diagnose a case and give proper guidance to them. There are consistent rituals that you have with the client that gives them comfort. What is the ritual they have when they deal with you? Like with my friend, there's always a surprise inside the cake. With the other friend, there's that story more connected to the gap. It's a consistent ritual that people will talk about. What's your ritual? That other friend of mine, the real estate agent, he will, when, when, when the property has been done and they've already finished the transaction, he treats the entire family to dinner. The family, not just the, not just the customer, the family. Because that's the ritual he wants to establish. There's consistent quality in the work. The fact, like Mandarin, why do I love Mandarin massage so much? Because regardless of the therapist who I get, it's consistent. It's the same. I'm not going to look for, oh, is, is um, Jolina there? No. Anyone who they give me, that's okay. And lastly, there's consistency with the relationship. With, when you deal with your customers, you build a relationship with them. So therefore, the relationship also has to be consistent. You cannot be super lover one day and cold shoulder the next. If you decide on the first engagement with your customer, you will be super lover, then be super lover for the entire time. You cannot be cold shoulder at any time. I know of clients that if their carefully calculated strategy is to be sufficiently cold and sufficiently warm. I don't know if that makes sense. On the first engagement, they're just going to be very professional. But what they're going to do is they'll start to build a relationship so that it becomes warmer and warmer. But they're not warm from day one. Then I discovered, because this is an accounting firm, they look, they want, they're looking for, for something very analytical. So the clients look for something analytical, but eventually they warm up. So they build the relationship consistently. Unlike an ad agency, in an ad agency, we're so used to what we call Chica Factor in the Philippines. Where, How are you? How's your life? Why are you married? Like, oh my gosh, one of my staff I almost painted. 
she, she asked the client, how's your divorce? Like, oh my gosh, why would you ask the client that? <laughs> and then this, this account person told, asked the client, um, is it true that you and Takli are lovers? Oh my gosh, why are you asking if the client is dating the other client? Oh my gosh, oh, so I have to like, you know, pull her back and you never ask this from client. So there, the, the relationship is consistent. So I don't know why I referred to that story, but there. So the wow experience really makes a difference in your personal branding. When you understand what your personal branding, you can already start to create what is the wow experience connected with your brand. Like your social media company, how do you deal with clients that makes you different from other social media companies? Then you gotta discover that and deliver that to the clients as well. And you know, as we end, why is this important? Because right now, there's really all these global trends in doing business, and these are the following trends that I've noticed um, recently. There's a dem higher demand for personalization. It's the rise of the omni-channel and online presence, automated business operations, and the power of customer advocacy. What do these mean? Number one, demand for personalization. Customers no longer want a one-size-fits-all solution. They want that you take care of them individually. You gotta create something unique just for them. Filipinos, they love that. When you create a package that's exclusively for them. I remember before, my real estate agent, when I first bought my first condo, I was, I was, I was jogging between two real estate companies. One real estate company said, this is it, this is our packages, take it or leave it. The other one said, how much can you afford to pay on your first year? I said, oh, I can afford to pay this. Okay, we'll make it that. And then second year, we'll increase it to this. Third year, we'll increase it to that. And so I bought from the second company. Because they, gave, they made a solution for me. And that one I love. The second thing is what we call the rise of the omni-channel and online presence. Right now, customer shopping behavior is shifted from just simply going straight to the store and buying. People research right now. Before they even, before they even contract you, they're going to research on you. For those of you who are solopreneurs, how's your LinkedIn profile, for example? Because people look at that. They're gonna see who has recommended you. You gotta invest on your LinkedIn. You gotta check a Google. Did you have you ever done a Google search on your name? Because if you Google search your name and you know there's bad stuff there, you gotta fix that. And what you're looking for is that people re people recommending you because of the service that you give. And this, this is what omnichannel online presence means. It means that everything is seen by the customer at all times. Before, the customer can do trial and error. They'll go to your shop and it sucks, they'll never go there again. Right now, they won't even step into your shop because they would have already known that the food is horrible in your restaurant. Third, automated business operations. Businesses are, simply, are now simplified operations by automating work process. How does that apply to us in the consumer experience? We can automate a lot of things as well. When a customer comes in, have we set up an, uh, an email account to automatically give them a thank you note, to write them on their birthday, to, to give thanks. We don't need to know every customer's birthday. I, 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 I have difficulty remem remembering all my sister's birthday, so imagine a million customers, but you can automate the process. We were just talking right now, uh, we were just talk I was talking to a company right now and the objective was, you know, they, they, they mentor entrepreneurs. And I was telling them, don't greet the entrepreneur on the birthday, greet the entrepreneur on the anniversary of the company. Because, happy anniversary, your company survived another year. That's something to celebrate, right? So that's, that, that's, what, automa what, that's what automation does. Look for ways to automate your experience. And lastly, the power of customer advocacy. Your clients will take photos, will write reviews about you, and they will share this in testimonials. And chances are, there's a higher probability if it's a negative feedback, that's when they'll say something about it. Your job is to make them fall so much in love with you that it will override their resistance to write something positive and actually do write something positive. But what happens when a client writes something negative? Never make the mistake of combating the client because I've seen clients who fight their clients who write stuff, ne negative stuff about them. Your objective is to reach out to them. You can still correct the damage. Reach out to them, ask them, how can we make our service better? Because sometimes the, the worst clients turn out to be the best ones if you manage to convert them. 
And that's a challenge for those of us in, in, in business, right? So to end, you know, in the face of these business trends, what now matters is what the branding experience our customers get with our brand. It, what is the experience that they get from the moment they deal with you to the moment they leave your shop? And it has to be consistent, it has to be excellent because people fall in love because of experiences. So you gotta make your experience love. You've got to make your experience love. And that's what experiential quality is. So thank you everyone for your time. I'm going to give you a little bit of a final request. I'm going to plug in one of our events. So we have this we have this conference called the Unapologetic Conference. It's coming, it's happening October 20 here in SpaceX. We're gonna have 10 speakers from from different fields. In essence, if you had a dream, if you have a, let's say a, a business, you want to take it to the next level. This is the conference where we're not just going to give you inspiration. We're going to actually make you do something. Because like what we said, our hashtag is get shit done. Which means we're going to have not just speakers, but there are going to be activities that you guys are going to have to do. If you want to know more about that, Kia over here, please give your email to her in the, during, the, during dinner and sign up to her. It's going to be an amazing, amazing event. So we're going to have speakers on personal finance, entrepreneurship, for those of you who want to write your own book, write your book. We have somebody, Kia will be talking about creative ideation, the ability to innovate and think creatively. There's going to be tons of speakers, tons of activities. So we do hope to see you there. But for now, thank you very much, everyone. You were a pleasure to be with. And dinner is served. So I get the honor of leading you to dinner. So guys, dinner is served. Thank you.